In the last lecture, we looked at ab initio Hartree-Fock theory and talked about the basis sets that are employed in order to accurately solve every integral that appears in the Fock matrix. And although I may have forgotten to make it explicit, the point of using these Gaussian basis sets that we discussed is that Gaussian functions permit the analytic evaluation of every single integral we need, the kinetic energy integrals, the nuclear attraction integrals, the electron repulsion integrals. And as a result, digital computers can, in principle, quite quickly assemble the Fock matrices, solve the secular equations, and come up with molecular orbitals and full many electron wave functions for any molecular system of interest. But remember that the fundamental approximation of the Hartree-Fock approximation is that there is no correlated motion of electrons. Instead, each electron sees the potential that derives from the molecular orbital occupations of all the other electrons. So those molecular orbital occupations, that's a bit like averaging over time. It's an equilibrium distribution, you might call it. Of course, two electrons having the same charge, they would tend to avoid one another if they can as they come close to one another. But in the absence of knowing about their correlated motion, there may in fact be an error. So let's just ask that question. How important is electron correlation? So this I just said. Let me look at the Fock operator again and just emphasize that there is a correct operator for kinetic energy, correct operator for nuclear attraction, but here's this Hartree-Fock approximation that there is a potential that each electron I sees associated with all the other electrons J, and it's an average potential. So let's do the hydrogen atom. That's a one electron system. It's pretty easy. We're going to use an infinite basis set. So uh, if you like, maybe it's STO infinity G decontracted so that every one of those is a, a basis function. So of course we can't do that in practice, but in uh, we, we can't do it ideally, but in practice we can use so many that we converge the results. And what you find is the Hartree-Fock energy is minus one-half an atomic unit, and the exact energy, remember this is one of the few problems we can solve exactly, it's the one electron problem, it's a half an atomic unit. So fabulous. There is no electron correlation in a one electron system, there's only one electron. Now, let's look at helium. That ought to be a pretty simple system. Now there are two electrons. Well, if you do an infinite basis set Hartree-Fock calculation, you will predict that the binding energy of those two electrons to the helium nucleus is minus 2.86168 atomic units, and I stopped after five digits. However, the exact energy, which can be determined from old oh, ionization potential experiments, for instance, or better calculations, is minus 2.90372. And so remember that an atomic unit of energy, the Hartree, is 627.5095 kcals per mole. So the error we've made is 26 kcals per mole. That's a little bit more than one electron volt. And that's kind of a shocking number, really. That was just adding one more electron, and we've got a 26 kcal per mole error. So remember that at room temperature, an error of 1.4 kcals per mole in, say, an equilibrium constant, a rate constant, is... Uh, sorry, in an, in an equilibrium energy or an uh, activation-free energy, that is a factor of 10 in an equilibrium constant or a rate constant. So 26 kcals per mole, that would correspond to something like uh, almost 20 orders of magnitude error in any kind of calculation you might do attempting to predict equilibria or rates. And that's obviously pretty unacceptable. So that ought to be frightening to you. And so in order to place electron correlation back into the calculation, there are a variety of methods, so-called post-Hartree-Fock methods, that can be employed to improve the energetics and the wave function. And I'm going to begin, this video is going to focus on configuration interaction as a model to put electron correlation in. So remember that the Hartree-Fock one electron orbital, the molecular orbital, it's expressed as a linear combination of basis functions where we optimize these expansion coefficients that multiply the basis functions according to a variational principle. And the many electron wave function that we make as the Slater determinantal product of all these MOs 
minimizes the Hartree-Fock, uh, gives, gives the minimal Hartree-Fock uh, wave function, but those orbitals should not be thought of as being perfect in any way because the Hartree-Fock approximation is just that, it's an approximation. So maybe a way to improve things, let's just remember for a moment that we found that we could get better basis functions by taking the basis functions themselves as a linear combination of primitive functions. And we find we get better molecular orbitals when we take a linear combination of basis functions. So let's carry this idea one step further, this business of taking linear combinations of things, and let's think about all the different Slater determinants you could make using the Hartree-Fock orbitals. So the Hartree-Fock wave function is an anti-symmetrized product of the occupied molecular orbitals that come out of the Hartree-Fock calculation. But let me think about other possible Slater determinants, and I'll think about them systematically. What if I consider a Slater determinant where I will replace one of the occupied molecular orbitals, so I'll run over I, with a virtual orbital in that product, so it's, it's just a different Slater determinant. And so I've indexed at lower right, where did I get the electron from? And at upper right, where am I putting it? Which, which occupied has been replaced by which virtual? And that'll be a whole new set of Slater determinants. And you could compute how many there are based on the size of the basis set and how many occupied orbitals there are. And then the next step would be to consider what if I swap out two of the occupied orbitals for two of the virtual orbitals. And now I'll have a set of psi Slater determinants where I've replaced ij with rs. And I can keep going, and it doesn't go indefinitely because there are only so many occupied orbitals, but you know it'll go for a while before I run out of electrons. And I could imagine that I will now write the wave function as this linear combination of Slater determinants where now my goal is to optimize these coefficients, a. And this is called configuration interaction. And these would be the ci coefficients. So if you feel like you've seen a lot of linear combinations, you have. And I'll just try to cement home for you so you kind of see the relationships. So far we've talked about basis functions, which are linear combinations of primitive Gaussians. And in that case, the coefficients are locked coefficients. Then we have molecular orbitals, which are linear combinations of basis functions, and we follow a variational process in Hartree-Fock theory to get those coefficients. And then finally, we can have an improved wave function by taking a linear combination of Slater determinants and using a variational principle to optimize the CI coefficients. So lots and lots of this linear combination thing going on where the variational principle just keeps proving to be this wonderful tool to allow us to find optimal values of coefficients. And so I want to illustrate this in, in sort of the simplest case because the math quickly gets a little bit ugly, but it's not terrible if you just think about hydrogen and not just hydrogen, hydrogen gas, that is H2, and we're going to use a minimal basis set so that means we're going to have a 1s orbital from one hydrogen and a 1s orbital from the other hydrogen, and that's our entire basis set. So we'll only have two molecular orbitals, and they're the ones that we always see in chemistry. There's a sigma orbital and a sigma star orbital. So if I now think about writing the CI wave function, I'm going to have a Hartree-Fock uh, wave function, and that means the two electrons in the sigma orbital. And then I can think about exciting an electron out of sigma to sigma star, one electron. And I can also think about taking both electrons, so I'll run over both occupied orbitals, one, one, two, two would be the indices here, if this is orbital one and this is orbital two. And so I've indicated that here, there's some coefficient times sigma squared, that's what the Hartree-Fock, this is just the shorthand Slater determinant for two electrons in the sigma orbital. A sigma star squared contribution and it turns out you know you can invoke group theory if you like it turns out you can also invoke something called Koopman's theorem to show that uh, this second term must go to zero so that makes our math a little bit easier but in any case the CI wave function then is going to be coefficient sigma squared plus coefficient sigma star squared of course in the Hartree-Fock uh, wave function a is, this A here is 1, and this is 0. That's how we got Hartree-Fock. But now we're going to see, is there a combination of a, these two A's, where this is no longer 1, and this is some value, that uh, improves things, improves the energetics. 
and I have this little subscript zero here, just because you sometimes see the notation differently, you'll often see a zero subscript on the hartree fock uh, wave function, but then when you start looking at matrices, it appears in the first position of a matrix, so you just have to get used to seeing it in different notational styles. So I want to solve a secular de determinant equation, just as I always do, where there's an H11 and an H22, and I've got energy times overlap on the diagonal. And in this case, the overlap of sigma with sigma is 1, so I don't write S11 here, I just write 1. And the overlap of sigma with sigma star is 0, so you don't see any overlaps appearing here. These are orthogonal orbitals to one another. And so I have a pretty simple secular determinant. All I, I really need at this stage is to know what is uh, the value of the individual H elements. Well, H11, that's the Hamiltonian in between the hartree fock wave function. That's easy, that's the hartree fock energy. So I just evaluate the Hamiltonian for my hartree fock wave function. Uh, H22, I could also value it. I would need to plug in uh, sigma star everywhere I plugged in sigma. It'd be some number. I'm not gonna write down the number at the moment. And then finally, what about these off diagonal elements? Well. If you were to construct for the Hamiltonian, and remember the Hamiltonian is kinetic energy, nuclear attraction, uh, electron repulsion, if you plugged in sigma and sigma star in all the appropriate places, you would discover that most of it goes to zero, and the only term that survives is the exchange integral k between sigma and sigma star. All right, And exchange integrals if you remember, they have a certain form, but uh, it is an electron repulsion integral, so it's a positive number. And if you're thinking, wait, doesn't exchange stabilize things? Remember, the integral is positive. You subtract it in the energy expression when you're figuring out how exchange contributes to energy. But here, it's just being treated as a number, so it's a positive number. So if I expand this determinant, that's this diagonal uh, minus this diagonal, I, and now I collect terms, I'll end up with e squared minus some of these two terms times e plus a whole bunch of constants equals zero. This is the equation I'm trying to solve, and it's a quadratic equation. So if I use the quadratic formula, I'll discover that the two roots are e equals h11 plus h22 plus or minus the square of this plus this all divided by two. And what I want to sort of prove to you is that the lowest energy eigenvalue is lower than the hartree fock energy. And an easy way to see it, hopefully, is to think about it this way. Well, H11 plus H22, what is that? It's the sum of the energy of the hartree fock and whatever the excited state is, and then I divide by 2. So a way to think about that is it's the average of those two energies. So it's right in between the two. And now, what's over here in the uh, square root symbol? Well, I've got H11 minus H22. Okay, that's the difference in the two energies. So if I square the difference in the two energies, and then I take the square root, forget about this term for a minute, if it were zero, let's just uh, imagine what would happen. Difference squared square root, well, I'll just get the difference, and then I divide it by two. Well, if you take the average of something, and you either add or subtract half the difference, you just get back to the original places. That would give you either H11 or H22. So if there were no coupling in this off diagonal position, then the two energy roots would be H11 and H22. And that should be sort of obvious just from the linear algebra. That would make this zero if either of these two E's, if, if E is either, excuse me, H11, this would be zero, so I take a determinant to be zero. If this is H22, this would be zero, and I said this was zero, so I get zero. Okay, that all works. But when it's not zero, that is, this exchange integral is a number. I square it, so it's definitely a positive number, and I multiply times 4. So everything under the square root radical is a little bit bigger than the square of the difference between the two state energies. So I'm either going to add or subtract something bigger than half the difference between the two energies. So when I subtract it, I'll end up moving down lower than I was before. When I add it, I'll move up higher than I was before. So having expressed my wave function in this fashion, I'll get a lower energy, 
And when I go and I use that energy to determine coefficients in this expansion, I'll get values for A1 and A2 that'll be my CI wave function. So CI in a nutshell, the larger the CI matrix, so that's the matrix just uh, of all those elements that appear in the secular uh, determinant we just showed. So we had a really trivial one. We had two by two. But now imagine a more complete CI matrix. So here's this kind of unique position. This is the 1-1 one, one spot. That's where we had H11 one, one minus E. So if you like, this is the Hartree-Fock energy piece. And from something called, uh, uh, from a, a theorem whose name is momentarily escaping me, uh, there is a theorem that says the contribution, the H elements that appear between the Hartree-Fock wave function and the first excited state wave functions of single excitations, those are always zero. So I'd have a whole bunch of zeros here. And then we get to all the double excitations. So H19, for instance, would be the matrix element. So I walk over here nine enough and it starts to fall in here. Anyway, this matrix begins to get very, very large, of course, as I consider all of these possible excitations because there's probably a lot of occupied orbitals and a lot of virtual orbitals. But it's never really going to zero anymore until you get to putting the Hamiltonian in between any two determinants that differ by three or more excitations. And that's called the Slater-Condon rules. If you just look at the matrix elements, you discover that they all go to zero because usually because you're taking overlaps of orthogonal orbitals. So we don't need to go into that. That's sort of detailed electronic structure theory. But you do have these uh, matrices that have, they're, they're big and they've got lots of numbers in them. The larger you, the further out you go, the more electron correlation you capture. And uh, notice, in addition to including more and more excitations, you get bigger. Also, if your basis set gets bigger, then the number of possibilities up here uh, become much larger. Unfortunately, uh, experience has shown that CI calculations, CI's configuration interaction, are more sensitive to basis set incompleteness than Hartree-Fock calculations. So that implies if you're going to do a correlated calculation, you really ought to use a bigger basis set in order to capture the correlation energy more efficiently. And so because of all those uh, concerns, what people will tend to do is truncate their level of excitation, and a typical truncation would be at the singles and doubles level, and that gives you this reduced matrix that is uh, used in solving the secular determinant. But it also introduces a problem, and that problem is known as size extensivity. So let me uh, ask you to consider the following. What if I have two H2 molecules and they are infinitely separated from one another so that they do not interact? And I'll continue to use a minimal basis representation. So I'll call one of them hydrogen molecule A and one of them hydrogen molecule B. Well, the energy, the CI energy for the two molecules will then be twice the energy of just one of those molecules, right? Because they don't interact. So that's pretty easy. And for one H2 molecule, well, CI doubles is actually exact, right? Because there are only, in a minimal basis set, that's everything. Two excitations is all you can do. And so if I multiply times two for CID for one hydrogen molecule, I got to get the right an energy for two hydrogen molecules that aren't interacting. But what if I actually construct the CI doubles wave function for the pair of the two molecules, actually just the full CI wave function for a moment. And so what is the correct wave function? Well, it's an anti-symmetrized product of the wave function of the individual molecules. And the individual molecules, of course, they have the same wave function. They just differ in whether I call it A or B. So here it is. There's some anti-symmetrization operator. It's A times sigma squared, A0 times sigma squared, plus A2 times sigma star squared, and then same thing over here, but it's for molecule B. So I'll just expand that out. So I get A0 times A0, A0 squared, sigma squared A times sigma squared B, so that's what I have here, plus there's a cross term, A0 times A2, where it's A times B, and then there's a different cross term, A0 times A2, where it's uh, A times B again, blah, blah, blah. And then finally, A2 times A2, sigma star squared, sigma star squared. But 
that is not a double excitation. That's a quadruple excitation, right? I took the two electrons here and the two electrons here, and I excited both of them. So while this is a correct wave function, when I do CI doubles, I would truncate that term. I would throw it away. And as a result, when I evaluate the energy, I will get something different than twice the energy of a single hydrogen molecule. And that's a problem. That is known as a violation of size extensivity. And that just uh, emphasizes what I said. When I truncate, that's the problem. So uh, violating size extensivity is, is an unfortunate uh, problem. You can sort of see that it certainly doesn't make physical sense, and it can lead to problems in calculations. Now, people avoid, for the most part, CI singles and doubles calculations now, uh, in part because of the size extensivity problem, and there are other approaches that seem to be better, and we'll talk about some in future videos. But I want to talk a little about CI calculations as they are used in the modern day, and there are certain variations on uh, what I've told you right now, and it's worth understanding those. So one approach is to say, well, if I'm not going to include every excited configuration, and when you do include every excited configuration, that's called full CI. That means I'm going to allow every single electron to be simultaneously excited into any possible combination of virtual orbitals so that I will use every single Slater determinant that can be built with my basis set and with my electrons. Full CI is size consistent because there's no truncation, but it is honking fabulously expensive. It's really only available to systems having a, a very small number of electrons, maybe five, six, seven, something like that. Even that would start to get expensive because you need a big basis set. So if you are going to make a truncation, you know, maybe you should recognize that the orbitals that you're using in your Slater determinants came from Hartree-Fock theory. So maybe I ought to allow those orbitals to relax as I take linear combinations of determinants. So that's one thing you might do. Another thing you might do is say, you know, it's true, full CI has a whole bunch of excitations, but which ones really ought to matter? It certainly seems as though a determinant where I take an electron out of a really low energy orbital and I put it up into a really high energy orbital, I mean, how likely is that to be an important contributor? Much more likely, you would think, would be sort of a window around the frontier energy. That is, if I include the HOMO and the LUMO, yeah, you know, that's a low energy excited orbital and a high energy occupied orbital. You could imagine that might matter. And okay, maybe I should also include HOMO minus one and LUMO plus one. But in any case, I'll take more excitations out of high energy orbitals and into low energy orbitals. And you can uh, have an enormous amount of flexibility in some sense. So if this is the total range of molecular orbitals from a Hartree-Fock calculation, ranging from the lowest energy one to the HOMO to the LUMO to the highest energy one, well, then among the things you can do is to have a window near the frontier. So this is what I call the frontier where maybe you'll actually do full CI in this window. That is, you'll consider every possible arrangement of these four electrons in this picture in these four orbitals. And then maybe you'll go to another window and you'll say, okay, and outside that, I'll let a few electrons, maybe N of them, maybe I would select N is two, and I will consider two electrons from here going either into here or into here, but I won't let there be more than two electrons up in here. And so that'll generate fewer configurations and it'll be a little more efficient. And then maybe I'll have some orbitals that I don't allow to excite, but maybe I will optimize their shapes as I carry out this calculation. And finally, I may have some orbitals, typically core orbitals, for example, where I say, you know what, I'm just going to keep them just the way they came out of a Hartree-Fock calculation. So there's all this flexibility in how you do this. And in general, this kind of a wave function is called a multi-configuration, because you're considering multiple ways to populate the orbitals, self-consistent field, because you are self-consistently determining orbital shapes, and special cases are called CAS SCF, complete active space SCF, and so that's where you have this full CI within a limited window, or RAS SCF, which is restricted active space, that's where you have certain windows in the space that have limited excitations 
uh, and you'll find these in the literature used for various things. Now, a final option, just to give you the full scope of all the things you can do with CI, is to say, you know, once I do this MCSCF, where I've relaxed some orbitals, I've considered some kinds of excitations, you could then take the next step and say, okay, now I'm freezing those orbitals, I'm not going to change their shapes, but I'll consider some additional excitations I didn't consider before, and that'll certainly give me a better wave function because I'll have a more flexible wave function. So that's a, a configuration interaction after the MCSCF, and that's called multi-reference CI, MRCI. So MRCI, very expensive, but typically a very good calculation, high-level calculation. So here's a conceptual test to end this video. Uh, if you were to optimize the geometry of a molecule, pick your favorite molecule, could be methane at the Hartree-Fock level, and then you optimize it again, but at the configuration interaction level. So you can, in fact, do this. You can compute analytic gradients. You can optimize a geometry on a CI potential energy surface. What would you expect for the bond lengths in methane? Would the CH bonds be longer at the CI level? or would they be shorter at the CI level compared to the Hartree-Fock level? And, of course, you have a 50-50 chance of guessing correctly there, and I guess you have to assume they don't stay exactly the same, or I wouldn't be asking this question. But what I want you to do is explain how you came up with your, uh, your prediction. Do they get longer or do they get shorter? So think about the examples we've looked at, think about what the CI procedure really does, and see if you can answer this question. Okay, that's that.